I know that Antoine already told you a little bit about that, um, but we'll go through it nonetheless uh, so that we'll be on the same page. I will then introduce two key experiments going on at the AEI, namely the hexagon interferometer and the three backlink experiment. Um, and that will be intertwined with a number of uh, metrology challenges they address. I'll then briefly mention uh, other activities going on and leave you with a short summary. All right, as you probably know, the LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, LISA, is a spaceborne gravitational wave observatory aiming to measure sources in the 0.1 to uh, 0.1 millihertz to 1 hertz frequency regime, or rather that is the frequency regime we are testing our technology for. Um, in essence, it's three, bay, uh, three spacecraft orbiting the sun in a tilted cartwheel formation with in, a mean inter-spacecraft uh, arm length of 2.5 million kilometers um, and a peak target strain sensitivity surpassing 10 to the minus 21 uh, per root hertz. Um, similar to uh, ground-based detectors, core to LISA is the optical readout of differential path lengths between free-floating test masses. However, as the test masses are aboard drag-free controlled uh, spacecraft, we have to use cascaded interferometry from test mass to optical bench on one spacecraft, optical bench to optical bench between spacecrafts, and optical bench to test mass on the far spacecraft. Um, due to the enormous interspacecraft distances, yet only limited telescope sizes, um, a spacecraft cannot act as a passive uh, end mirror to another spacecraft, so we have to use a master transponder scheme instead where the laser on the far spacecraft is uh, offset locked to the frequency of the inbound beam and then sent back in its place. Um, orbit dynamics um, give rise to continuous arm length changes on the order of plus minus 1%, as well as angular variations of 1.5 degrees um, over the period of a year. Please note that Int the intra-spacecraft test mass readout has been well tested as proven by the overwhelming success of LISA Pathfinder. So the remaining challenges are basically long arm interferometry and phase reference between two moving optical benches within one spacecraft. On the other hand, many aspects of inter-spacecraft interferometry will soon be tested within the GRACE follow-on mission, which is scheduled for launch in late April of this year. Um, now let's go to the list of metrology challenges and we'll start off with the primary beat note readout and phase extraction. Um, due to arm flexing, um, there will be large dynamic Doppler shifts. Um, so have, we have to use heterodyne interferometry with uh, photoreceivers and phase meters suitable for a frequency range of roughly 5 to 25 megahertz beat notes. Um, because of the enormous distances, we are expecting beat notes on the order of about 100 picowatts, um, which means we are building very low noise photoreceivers. Um, to meet the target peak strain sensitivity with enough mo noise margin, uh, we are aiming for a phase meter delivering picometers per root hertz precision. Um, and finally, since we are dealing with cascaded arm interferometry, um, there will be no cancellation of laser frequency noise in the sectional measurements. Um, so we need a phase readout system with high dynamic range, and we are talking about up to 10 orders of magnitude. So the problem is, how can we test a phase readout system for this unusually high level of uh, sensitivity? Um, an absolute signal test would require a signal generator with an extremely high phase fidelity, which is not readily available. A split signal test has two or more phase meters measure the same input signal and then compare the results. Um, while this is possible, it is unfortunately oblivious to common mode effects like phase nonlinearity or signal tri triggered cycle slips. So we should use a three signal test instead, and that is exactly what our hexagon does using optical source signals. So how does it work? We have three laser beams, each of which is split into two by means of three beam splitters. Um, then we have three more beam splitters, 
um, recombining pairs of beams from different source lasers, whose beat nodes can then be obtained by means of three primary and three secondary photoreceivers. If we now have the uh, lasers loosely offset locked to one another, um, that should give us these beat nodes. And it's easy to see that with the correct signs, um, the sum of these beat nodes should vanish. So if we measure um, the three beat nodes with three separate digital phase-locked loops of our phase meter, we should obtain a zero frequency sum or a constant phase sum, which should only be limited by noise and nonlinearities in the measurement process. We can also exploit the secondary photoreceivers for a second independent three-signal measurement, as well as for pi measurements, which can be used for diagnostic purposes. This is our ultra-stable hexagon bench, built in part by silicate bonding, optical contacting, and UV gluing. The unusual-looking quasi-monolithic fiber couplers um, have been custom-built by us for maximum thermal stability, and an improved version of those will also be employed in the um, three backlink experiment, which I will talk about in a few minutes. The hexagon has to be operated in vacuum, and our noise hunts are still ongoing. Um, this is one of our recent performance results. Um, the two blue curves correspond to the two individual uh, three signal tests, while the red curve is um, the balanced version of the two. As you can see, there's not much of a difference, um, which means that we are not limited by stray light anymore, as we were before. Um, finally, the green curve is um, the sum of the three individual pi measurements. Okay, back to the list of metrology challenges, this time about post-processing and auxiliary functionality. Um, because of the arm uh, flexing, um, the direct signal combinations uh, for a two-arm LISA configuration would be equivalent to an unequal arm length Michelson interferometry, interferometer so that laser frequency noise would not cancel. That's why we need time delay interferometry, uh, which uses sums of delayed signals to synthesize an equal arm length interferometer in post-processing. TDI requires absolute ranging, so we need to use the NASA Deep Space Network for coarse positioning, plus a weak pseudo-random noise code phase modulated onto the laser links for submeter accuracy. Ground uh, communication should prefer preferably only take place with one spacecraft at a time. So inter-spacecraft communication will piggyback on the PRN codes. And finally, since each spacecraft is running on its own separate clock, we need to use clock tone transfer via gigahertz sidebands on the laser links for dynamic resampling and post-processing, which is also often considered to be part of TDI. Now the beauty of the hexagon is that it can actually test the last three points of these as well. To see this, let's start with a three spacecraft LISA constellation and do a step-by-step -step simplification. If we assume that there are no external forces acting upon the three laser spacecraft, LISA spacecraft, um, we could remove the test masses along with the dedicated readout interferometers and use only one optical bench and one laser per spacecraft. If we now remove all clockwise laser links, we are left with a configuration as indicated here. Um, and if we then remove the telescopes and shrink the constellation down to fit onto a single ultra-stable optical bench, we'll have uh, successfully recreated the hexagon. And that is why the hexagon can, in fact, be used to test drive the full LISA arm metrology chain. Now, this slide is rather busy, so let's try to break it down. We have three rows corresponding to the three LISA spacecraft. Um, the hardware in the rows is completely independent from one another, um, and all communication between the rows is mediated through the laser links via the hexagon. From left to right, each spacecraft um, is equipped with its own uh, clock in the first gray column and its own phase meter in the second gray column, followed by three dedicated laser preparations, and finally the hexagon in a vacuum chamber. Now, I won't go into much detail here, so suffice it to say that these phase meters, um, besides the primary and secondary beat note uh, tracking, also implement automatic beat note acquisition, laser offset locking, 
quad phase tracking optimized for differential wavefront sensing, pilot tone injection and tracking, clock tone transfer, submeter intersatellite ranging, and a low bandwidth data communication. So that's our hexagon. Um, now let's look at intra spacecraft motion and spurious light. Um, The angular breathing uh, within the LISA con uh, configuration um, gives rise to various, to, to variable uh, pointing of the telescopes and their rigidly attached dedicated optical benches um, so that we need um, an inter-bench phase reference distribution system, PRDS, or otherwise known as backlink, to subtract laser frequency noise and post-processing. Here the requirement is two picometers per root hertz of reciprocal phase noise um, which I'll, we'll get to uh, in a minute um, with three backlink experiment. Um, up next, we have imperfect coatings, impurities, and plain old quantum mechanics, which give rise to ghost beams and scattering, and in turn to spurious in-band beat notes in our uh, interferometers, which is especially problematic when thermally or mechanically driven. Um, a sub-item of the previous bullet point is actually fiber backscatter with NPM fibers, which has previously been measured to be of the order of four parts per million per meter. Um, but what are the effects of cosmic and solar radiation on uh, fibers and other components? Um, to find out, we are conducting a separate experiment in collaboration with the Fraunhofer INT, uh, where we are using gamma neutron radiation. All right, so what's the backlink? Um, the objective is the following. Each spacecraft houses two TX laser sources, one for each arm, as indicated here in red and green, um, which need to be interconnected by a flexible optical fiber backlink. Now, the first uh, solution that comes to mind is to use a PM fiber, which is flexible by design. We could then lock the green laser to the red one using the upper interferometer. However, um, a fiber has a very poor path length stability, um, so we would have to um, use the lower interferometer to measure the phase drift between the two lasers for subtraction and some in post-processing. However, this only works if and only if the backlink behaves reciprocally. That means um, it, at every moment in time it exhibits the exact same path length uh, in both directions. To uh, test this in a lab, we place this on a, a common slab of zero door um, and add a a reference interferometer in the middle, and that's the idea of the classic fiber backlink experiment. Um, however, as it turned out, this was not sufficient um, because we got back reflected beams wherever light was coupled into a fiber coupler, um, which gave us various beat notes in our interferometers. So we added attenuation stages after the TX fiber couplers um, so that back reflected beams were attenuated twice as much as the TX beams. Unfortunately, no such solution exists for the backlink fiber couplers um, because backlink light and spurious beams would see the same attenuation. As you can see, with the attenuation stages and balance detection, we were pretty much able to uh, meet the required phase fidelity. Um, however, balance detection requires more photo receivers and, photo, uh, and phase meter channels, which is something that we are trying to avoid in LISA. Um, so, the question is, can we do better? And um, we hope so. Um, uh, in particular, there are two candidates that we're looking at uh, that are worth investigating. This time, we actually need rotating benches. Um, uh, so we cannot use a true reference interferometer as we did before. Um, but we'll use um, uh, Faraday isolators uh, after the TX fibers to reduce the stray lights uh, from the fiber couplers. Um, so the first uh, alternative backlink um, is the so-called frequency shifted backlink, which uses one local, one additional local oscillator per bench to mitigate the overall path length uh, measurement um, and avoid uh, spurious in-band beat notes altogether. The second alternative swaps the fiber for a polarization encoded free beam. Um, so that the opposing beams can be separated before a reflection at the fiber end uh, can take place. Um, now, if you take these three basic ideas and fold them into a single uh, integrated experiment, you end up with something that looks like this. Um, we just got started on building the first of these very complex uh, ultra-stable benches. Um, 
yeah, so this is the this is going to be the, the three backlink experiment. Let me briefly mention a few other activities. Um, the AI's Lisa Optical Bench uh, test bed is used um, to learn about uh, the suppression of tilt to length coupling, which arises when science beam and reference beam and an interferometer are not uh, quite aligned to one another. Um, the cartwheel role of the Lisa formation gives rise to um, or necessitates a point-ahead angle mechanism. Um, Ultra-stable monolithic fiber couplers for space missions are being uh, developed in the UK, while 30 centimeter telescope optics and scatter simulations are being investigated at NASA. A very interesting uh, technology is being looked into at Airbus, um, namely the infield pointing approach, which has the potential to get rid of the backlink fiber altogether by using a single optical bench with two rigidly attached wide field of view telescopes in conjunction with beam steering. However, the downside of this technology is that, the actu that we have actuators in the optical science path um, where, op where uh, absolute path lengths do matter and um, these types of telescopes are more prone to scattering. Of course, there's much, much more which I cannot uh, mention at this point, so let me uh, leave you with uh, saying thank you very much for your attention and um, I'll be happy to take a few questions. Thank you very much for these beautiful uh, experiments. Any questions or comments in the public? Okay, could, could you just remind us when you need to finish such things because I know that just Antoine was showing some, some planning. It seems to be uh, a planning which would be, uh, you need to, to conclude such tests before 2022 or something like that? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have the, the timetable in my head. Um, we are, <coughs> the, the LISA mission is officially scheduled for 2034, um, but we're uh, pretty much uh, confident that we can do it by 2030 or even a little bit earlier than that. Um, for the backlink, we have a timetable um, which should be done within the next one or two years. So it's very, uh, yes, um, and there is still a lot of work to be done. All this demonstration and all these things should be, should be done by 2022 by adoption by ESA when you start phase C for industrialization. Thanks. Okay, any other? So regarding the backlink, um, I, I know in, in, at the University of Florida they are, they are trying to look into a um, free space backlink. Uh -huh. Have you considered that? You're not considering because they are looking into that? Or is it no, like, no, you know, no, 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 um, no. We are any fiber. We, we are actually looking into this. Um, so we, in the three backlink experiment, we're, uh, we have two candidates, um, alternative candidates, and one sort of reference interferometer, um, which we know works. That's the, the modified version of the fiber, of the classical fiber. Um, and one of the candidates is a free beam experiment um, where we have actuator mirrors. Um, and the free beam will be polarization encoded so that you can take apart the, the two opposing beams. Um, and um, the reason why we think we can do this with steering mirrors is that uh, reciprocal uh, phase is, should not be a problem as long as you um, hit the same spots on the mirrors, um, whereas the, the absolute path length is okay. Um, and we have already conducted a pre-experiment with that using uh, off-the-shelf optical equipment uh, with bench rotation uh, and uh, having this run in a control loop, and that was successful. Okay. Sure. Any other urgent questions or comments? Okay, so let's thanks again to the speakers. And moving back to Mato for the coming back.